Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to take part in this wonderful panel. I'm honored and very humbled to be a part of this distinguished group and to share the stage with folks whose writings I've read and admired and learned from for many years. Um, in my brief comments, and I see the clock is already ticking, uh, I'd like to talk about um, an aspect of U.S.-China relations that has been alluded to but not yet delved into, and that is the question of China as a factor in U.S. politics, and specifically uh, the evolving politics of U.S.-China relations. I think it's a very topical uh, issue to discuss uh, as we talk about cooperative security between the United States and China, and as we sit here in the shadow of the United States Capitol with the great, the great view that we have. What I'd like to do is talk about four, uh, four things. Number one, uh, 2012 as a very special political year in the relationship. Number two, uh, three key shifts in, uh, in China as a factor in U.S. politics. Number three, I'd like to talk about four recent comments by major U.S. national political figures that illustrate these shifts. And then four, I'll end with a few, uh, fourthly, I'll end with a few concluding comments. And I note that uh, there's a Chinese propensity to use numbers to talk about groups of issues, uh, the three communiques, the five principles of peaceful coexistence. So I'll talk about the three shifts and the four comments. In terms of 2012, I think what we have is clearly a very unique and significant year in the politics of U.S.-China relations. Obviously, in terms of the political calendars, the United States has a presidential election, which we're well into on the GOP primary side, and which it continues to unfold. And at the same time, later this year, the Chinese will be going through the first part of a kind of Texas two-step uh, political transition, with the party transition taking place in October of this year, and then the national government transition taking place next year. I think it's worth noting that this um, convergence of the US, a U.S. political uh, season, a U.S. presidential election specifically, and the Chinese political transition is something that happens only once every 20 years. Uh, the last time this happened was in 1992. The next time it'll happen will be in 2032, and that's because the Chinese are on a five-year cycle and we're on a four-year cycle. Notably, in 1992, which was the last year in which these two events happened in the same year, uh, there wasn't a shift in China because Jiang Zemin, who was in power and who came into power after Tiananmen in 1989, didn't leave high office but rather continued in that high office and would continue as general secretary, as president, and chairman of the Central Military Commission for another 10 years beyond 1992. So this is really the first year in U.S. and Chinese history in which there is going to be a transition in China and there could very well be a transition uh, with the presidential election here, and I think that's very significant. What it means is that there are very significant political pressures being brought to bear on both the U.S. leadership and the Chinese leadership in a way that we have never seen in the modern history of U.S. Chinese uh, U.S. China relations, and I think that's something to keep in mind as we talk about the topic of this session: uh, the notion of the U.S. and China being the pivotal relationship for cooperative security. Let me now move over to what I see as three key uh, and I think very significant shifts in the way that China comes into the question of U.S. politics and specifically the way it manifests itself in the context of U.S. presidential politics and a presidential campaign. Um, in 1992, which was the first presidential election after Tiananmen, which occurred in 1989, the key issue vis-a-vis -vis China in the U.S. presidential race was human rights. Um, and in fact, 1992 was really the first issue um, in which China was a, a controversial topic in U.S. politics uh, in sort of the, the post-Nixon era. Um, and so it manifested itself as essentially a proxy for the question of human rights. And when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas and running for president, he really spoke a lot about uh, uh, human rights problems in China. He even referenced, uh, as he put it, the butchers of Beijing. And this was the dominant theme, the dominant prism through which China was viewed and addressed in presidential discourse. Uh, 
But there's been an evolution in the way that China is framed and discussed in the context of U.S. presidential politics. And that's what I want to talk about now with reference to what I've referred to as the three shifts. The first shift is a shift from looking at pr China through the prism of human rights to looking at the China through the prism of economics, trade, and I would argue more broadly, national competition. And I think that's the most important idea. So whereas a generation ago, and even into 2000, with the Gore-Bush election, uh, China was viewed mostly through the context of human rights, today it is discussed almost exclusively by presidential candidates as an issue in, with respect to economics, trade, and competition. Number two, the second shift, is a shift, and th this I think is very significant and hasn't been commented upon much, and that is a shift at looking at China as a foreign policy issue toward looking at China as a domestic policy issue here in the United States. And that is a rather radical reframing of China in the U.S. political context. I'll give you some examples of that later. But if you think about the GOP debates which we've seen, uh, and I've, I've tried to watch just about all of them, perhaps about two dozen. Uh, I heard a few audible gasps uh, in the audience. But it's very interesting. It's, a, it's great insight into our politics. Um, and what's remarkable is in those debates, China virtually never comes up in the foreign policy parts of the debates. And it never comes up. In fact, I think there was times when it just did not come up at all in debates that were uh, that were marketed as foreign policy debates. Where it does come up is in issues like education, uh, manufacturing, the loss of jobs, economic growth, trade, but insofar as the creation of U.S. jobs is concerned, and so on. So China, in U.S. presidential politics, is no longer a foreign policy issue. It is a domestic policy issue. And the third shift is China used to be a measuring stiff, stick, a measuring stick, for the toughness of presidential candidates, now it has become a measuring stick for our national inadequacy. And we see this coming through a number of different remarks. But one interesting thing that I've tracked over the years is typically when U.S. presidential candidates talk about China, there is one word that is invariably, historically, invariably has been used within the same sentence, and that is the word tough. I'm going to get tough on China if you elect me president. My opponents aren't tough, but I'm tough. And if you look back at 2008, the last presidential race, um, you see the word tough coming out. It almost never comes out today, but instead, China is held up as a measuring stick, not for a candidate's toughness, but rather for our nation's adequacy or inadequacy. Let me give you very briefly four quick uh, comments that have been made by national political figures that I think bear out each of the shifts that I've talked about. First, in 2010, and I'll do this chronologically, Governor Rendell of Pennsylvania made a very interesting comment that I think is worth mentioning because I think it was the beginning of this different type of discussion of China at the national level. A, an NFL football game on Monday night was blizzarded out for the first time in the modern history of the NFL. And it prompted, Governor, it was in Philadelphia, the, the Philadelphia Eagles were hosting the Vikings, and Governor Rendell said, if this were China, they would have held the game. They would have had armies of volunteers coming to clean the streets of snow, and they would have been doing calculus problems as they did so. We have become a nation of wusses. That's what Governor Rendell said. A Democrat, by the way. The next comment that I think, or set of comments that was made that illustrate this, this notion of China as kind of existential competitor were the comments that President Obama made in the 2011 State of the Union Address, where he basically referred again, strikingly, and I think for the first time in American history, at least in the modern era, he referred to China not in the foreign policy section of his State of the Union Address, but rather in the domestic policy section, and he referred to China, and these are not his words but mine, but a close paraphrasing, as basically an existential competitive threat to the United States around the issues of education, manufacturing, economics, job creation, clean energy, and many of the issues that Martin alluded to right at the outset. And so the notion of China as existential competitive threat, rather than as a discrete, compartmentalized foreign policy challenge, is new. 
Uh, more recently, this year, Gingrich, uh, sp former Speaker Gingrich, in his run for the White House, uh, right after South Carolina as he was going to Florida, made the comment, and I'm paraphrasing closely, do we really want to let the Chinese be the first to colonize the moon? So he's talking about an enormous and significant uh, domestic policy program, space, but with reference to the Chinese. And then most strikingly, and I save it for last and it's the most recent, was a comment made by Governor Romney, which has gotten very little attention. It's certainly been noted, but not in, in this sense. Governor Romney said, if I be, and I'm paraphrasing closely, if I become president, I will look at federal spending, $4 trillion of the federal U.S. budget, and I will weigh it against one question and one question alone. Is this national spending priority worth borrowing money from China? If it is, we do it. If it's not, we don't do it. Now, in my history of looking at U.S. presidential contests, I've never heard a candidate for office until Governor Romney's remark measure all federal spending dollars against the China test. Is it worth borrowing from China or is it not? That, my friends, I would suggest uh, really gets at how deeply China has gotten into the American psyche and, and under, uh, under our skin. Let me conclude with a few brief uh, concluding comments, cognizant of our time limits here. Um, I think discourse about U.S.-China relations uh, is important because it has an impact not just on the tone but on the substance of U.S.-China relations. As we look at the Capitol here, I'm reminded of a broader idea, and that is public policy outcomes can never be very far removed from the quality of public policy discourse. And if we have bumper sticker discourse, the likelihood is we're going to have bumper sticker solutions, which is another way of saying we're not going to have solutions to our problems. And if we have this kind of uh, politi politicized rhetoric about China in our presidential politics, it's going to have an impact on the substance of foreign policy. I think what we see is an evolving narrative um, in, that is complicating relations and that is qualitatively different from the narrative that we have seen in U.S.-China relations up to now. It's not just about human rights, and in fact, oddly enough, it's really no longer just about foreign policy. It is about China as a presumed existential competitor to the United States. It's not about China as something that can be compartmentalized to the side, but rather China being a proxy for all that is potentially wrong with the United States. We've moved, in short, from we don't share or they don't share our values to a narrative of they're eating our lunch. We've moved from they're different from us to they're beating us. And that is, a, I think, a different dynamic in the discourse. It's one that is complicating the relationship. I don't think China or the United States and the United States are preordained to be either friends or foes. It will take effort to make them the former rather than the latter. And I think in this political season here, to say nothing of the political season in China, that work becomes more complicated in 20, uh, 2012 and 2013. And I think we all have our work cut out for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Super. Good.